So what is world building? So this comes from an article by Susan Carlin, who wrote um, the article that Richard mentioned by, on Fast Co Create, but it is Powell's world building uh, methodology. And it's a system for creating rules and behaviors for fictitious worlds. And that's what anthropologists look at as well, the rules of kinship. How do we know who's related to who? Or um, the behaviors people have about funerals or whatever it is. Anthropologists, is, anthropologists are looking at those things. Um, and how this arises from science, technology, social structure, geography, economics, and politics governing them. Anthropology isn't mentioned, but all of that is anthropology. World building has often tended to focus on some of the things that you guys are doing here, maybe more. Science and technology are some of the key things that people often get really excited about in world building. But we have to also think about those other little factors um, that are not little, but other factors that are impacting them as well. It's not just about the science and technology. And Alex is known for that. Um, he was also the production designer for Minority Report. And in Minority Report, if people have seen that movie, there's the screens where Tom Cruise is going like this. And so they developed this idea for Minority Report. And then the scientist who helped Alex develop that literally developed touchscreen technology from that movie and from the world that had been built. Um, and there are other things that are impacted. Biologists are often um, used uh, as well to look at different bodies and whatnot. And linguists and linguistic anthropologists. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how I got to Man of Steel now. So this is anthropology, world building, how the two go together. Um, and I've also worked with Navi speakers, who are the speakers who are learning the language from Avatar. And the world of Pandora was a very detailed, well-built world by James Cameron. And one of the things he did very early on was he knew who here, has anybody not seen Avatar? Okay, spoiler alert, <laughs> a few people, okay. Well, Avatar, one of the, the I think it's the largest grossing film, still. Um, and so James, Ca and there are sequels, I think there are up to four sequels coming. And a language was developed very early on because he wanted his um, Navi people to speak Navi. And these are what they look like, obviously. Um, and so the, he, uh, James Cameron hired a linguist named Paul Fromer, who's now a friend of mine. I just met him when I was in Los Angeles for the Science and Fiction Conference in person. Uh, we had a very lovely weekend together. Um, and so he developed this language to go with the film. And so there is spoken dialect in Avatar of Navi. It's a very large um, piece of that movie. And when that came out in December of 2009, there was um, they did a great viral marketing campaign. They had the um, handbook, the Explorer's Handbook to Pandora, came out in advance. And in there was a huge glossary of all of the Navi words for all the plants on Pandora and the animals and the names of things. And so people could learn the language in advance of the movie coming out. So the day after the movie opened, a man named Britton Watkins, who's also now a friend of mine, um, wrote an email to Paul Fromer entirely in Navi. He could do that from the viral marketing that had come out ahead of time. There was also a very specific linguist post um, in an obscure location where Paul Fromer had talked about it. Um, and so from that, this got very, uh, fans were very excited. Many, many people are huge fans of Avatar and became Navi speakers. Is anybody in here a Navi speaker? Yes? Oh, good. That's exciting. One of the few times I've said that, thank you for admitting that, because often people are shy about admitting that. Um, so maybe you have been on Learn Navi website and... Okay. Ah, Kalt. Irayo. And so uh, the, the website developed, the Learn Navi website for fans. And so when I teach my Introduction to Linguistic Anthropology course, my students are tasked um, developing their own languages. And part of that is world building. So when we learn about the basics of linguistics, the first thing we learn about, uh, one of them, is sounds. So they go out after we learn about phonology and sounds, and they pick their sounds for their language. And some people do really weird sounds like and 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 things like that. And some people pick very normal sounds. And so they pick their sounds. And then later on in the term, we learn how words are created. And then they go out and they develop their words. And then we do this throughout the course of the term. By the end of term, our last week of class is everybody presenting their languages. Um, and so when I heard that Avatar was doing this as well, of course, there's um, Klingon is the other really famous uh, movie language. Is anyone a Klingon speaker as well? 
Yay, we have some Klingon speakers too. Good. So I know may, way less Klingon. All I know is that uh, kapla, which is a very obvious one, right? And I'm probably not even saying. Pardon me? A lot of things. It does, yes. Success and lots of different things. Um, so Klingon wasn't for me. But I, this was a really good example coming out at the time where I could show my students, look, I'm not crazy for making you do this. Other people are doing this too. Um, and so uh, the year after that, I taught a fourth year course in anthropology on new languages. Part of the reason I taught it was because I had gone to Papua New Guinea for my other side of my academic work. Um, where I worked with the community to develop an alphabet for a language that had never been written before. And I had to learn a pidgin language, which is a new language. It's a mix of English uh, in Papua New Guinea, English and um, an indigenous language from there. And uh, then that, when that language, when pidgins become people's mother tongues, they're called creoles. So those were two types of new languages. And we also looked at created languages. So we looked at Klingon and Navi because that had come out. Uh, and my students and I tried to find these media sources where people were speaking Navi. And we found that the media was reporting thousands of people were learning Navi. And so um, the following year, I did a survey myself of Navi speakers, an online survey. I, had ex I was basing it on a survey of Klingon speakers. And they ended up getting about 20 speakers. So that's what I was expecting. I did this little online survey. I got 293 responses um, in the summer of 2011. So that was a bit of a long story to get to this point. <laughs> so um, after that, the UBC, where I teach in Okanagan, did a media release about my survey of Navi speakers and the diversity of who the speakers were. My youngest participant was 10. My oldest was 81. The average was um, 15 to 20 years old. And they were from all over the world. People answered it in eight different languages because the Navi community is very welcoming. And they translated it for me into eight different languages. And so this became um, part of this media story. So this was from CBC News at the time when I had done my survey. Uh, Avatar uh, Navi language garners real life fans. So this was one of the stories. The other story that came out that's really important to Man of Steel was this one in the Globe and Mail um, on Monday, August 8, 2011. And this was on the front uh, cover of the Globe and Mail. Um, this little snippet, this is actually talking about my work with endangered languages, which is one of the reasons I really love this article, because I feel like people can learn indigenous endangered languages um, using similar methods to how people are learning Navi. Because there are communities of these made up languages that didn't exist five years ago that are now, people are speaking that as their language of communication. So how can we use that for other real or natural languages to develop more speakers? So this was the front. And then there was this very long article on the inside cover page of the Globe and Mail, um, which talks about what I was doing. They also interviewed Paul Fromer, who also teaches at the University of Southern California, or did, um, and why this was important. So this was more my academic side, so I liked it. But going back to this. At this time, Alex McDowell, they were already filming Man of Steel. And they were filming in uh, Plano, Illinois, just outside of Chicago, filming the Smallville section. And they were getting ready to film here in Vancouver and Burnaby. So Alex McDowell got in a plane in Chicago, flew to Toronto, was handed a Globe and Mail, and then flew to Vancouver to come to Burnaby to start filming the Kryptonian sections of Man of Steel. He saw this and realized, oh, my world I'm building um, doesn't have a language. This is a key detail, and he is very much about details in the worlds that he creates. So we need to have this person come to Vancouver and tell us about language creation and how that could impact our world building. So that is how I got to Vancouver into Man of Steel. And it was very much about this, too. The fact that, as I said before, there's an S on an alien being's chest is a huge design problem. And he mentions this in the book Man of Steel, Krypton by Design. Um, and so what were we going to do about that? And uh, this, of course, is how the S has changed over time. Um, so the S, this is a little giveaway as well. I love this gift. So there's Alex. I'll show it again. It's not an S. On my world, it means hope. Uh, the word for hope in Kryptonian, in case you're interested. In my Kryptonian is Melor. So I had to enter the Fortress of Solitude. I was flown to Vancouver, and before I even got there, I had to sign confidentiality agreements. Um, and then, uh, when I got there, it was also called the Fortress of Solitude because in many, 
I've never worked on another movie, but in other movies, apparently the costumes and the art is very much exposed. With Man of Steel and Superman, it's such a cult classic that they were scared people were going to steal the story and figure it out in advance. And of course, that's horrible for any movie if people don't know the plot before it comes out. And so all of the detailed photos of the plot, the storyboard, were locked inside an internal room inside many different walls of security. Um, and so I got to hear the plot from Alex, and he mentioned this design problem. Um, and so I helped develop this giant design problem through my use of anthropology and linguistics. Um, and what did this S mean, and what, how could we develop more of the world? So another giveaway, plot, plot spoiler again. <laughs> Uh, this is the writing. So one of the ideas Alex's world building team had developed was that, one, there are no straight lines on Krypton. Um, so everything is rounded. This is um, one of the main scene areas uh, in Krypton. This is the council chambers. And there is writing on everything because they wanted to document their extensive history of their travels throughout the universe um, and also what had been happening on Krypton. By this point, they had really um, damaged the core. They're living underground and the, the planet is about to implode. And these are the council chambers um, and then Zod comes in. Uh, first Jor-El comes in and then Zod and they're talking about trying to save the planet. And there is literally writing. You can't see it as well on here, um, but on all, every single wall, on the chair, everywhere. There's writing everywhere. They were going to write, but they didn't have a language to put behind it. And so that's where I came in. Um, because previous versions of Kryptonian from the comics, um, Smallville, had different symbols. But they were always transliterators. They were A is this symbol, B is this symbol. So we developed the language that goes behind that. There is so much more information about Krypton than what appears in the movie. The team develops this world building aspect, the economies, the politics, the social structure. And so this is one um, that came out, some of the, the marketing that came out after the movie, before the DVD, um, looking at all of this other information about weaponry. Because you, weapons are used, but you don't know all the detail um, that was developed to go along with it. And so this is from a website called learnaboutcrypton.com. Um, this one is particularly about the cultures. There's planets. Uh, aviation, how, do, how does everything fly? So there's all these detail that Alex and his team developed that we don't get to see. The Blu-ray um, has four hours of extra features um, that are part of this uh, design of Krypton. Um, the symbols, as we saw, the glyph, the S is the symbol for hope, which is also the symbol for the House of El. Um, Cal El is Superman, Jor El. And then all of these other symbols are the glyphs that if you were from a different house, then that would be your glyph. And so Zod wears a different glyph on his chest. Faora, Zod's assistant, has a different glyph. So these were parts of that world building that was developed. So this part had already been developed before I got there. Uh, and then they wanted to have another way to write. And so we developed a different type of writing. So this is, these are the glyphs. We also developed a syllabic writing system. So when I was in the Fortress of Solitude, <laughs> learning about the plot, one of the things they asked me was, well, if we are going to write, what kind of writing system should we use? And that's one of the things, as an anthropologist, I know about many different types of writing systems. And this is one, um, this is Cree syllabics, actually. I, had st I have studied Cree in the past. And as far as I knew, um, Klingon, some of the other famous Navi, they weren't using a syllabic writing system. Another one is Dothraki. Dothraki doesn't have a writing system. That's from Game of Thrones. Um, David Peterson now does this as his full-time job. He works on many shows, many for the Sci-Fi Network. Um, and so I had suggested using this syllabic system. So what it is, there's vowels, and they have a simple symbol, the triangle. Uh, this one, these ones are very geometric. And then if you want, for example, a, ah, if you want pa, which is the P-A, you write it this way. If you want um, po, you flip it around. And so this was the idea that we would use similar shapes and flip them depending on the vowel. And that's what we ended up doing. We based it on Cree. So that's an interesting Canadian connection to Krypton. Uh, and this is what it ends up looking like. This chart, again, um, was developed by Darren Doyle, who had been developing his own Kryptonian language project and embraced mine very kindly, um, which was very different than his. His was based on the Smallville ones, and it was unofficial. Mine is the official version. Uh, so this is the similar shapes and the letters. 
These are all of the vowels of Kryptonian, and then you can see how they flip depending on what the vowel is. Um, and then this is P, and then that's B, and there's an entire chart developed about this. So this was the Slavic. So what would happen then was um, David Goyer, the writer for Man of Seal, would send me phrases of what he wanted written all over Durrell's laboratory, and on the weapons, and on the codex, which is an important part, which I won't tell you about if you haven't seen the movie. Um, and then uh, I would write those out and translate them. Uh, the person who designed this, the symbols, was actually a graphic designer called Kirsten Branson, who works a lot in Vancouver in the film industry. Um, and she had already developed a number system for Kryptonian, and so then based um, the, the letters on those. And uh, we were the two that worked on it most closely, and we were communicating in Kryptonian by the time we were done. We were the only two people who could do that. So the sounds, part of world building, sometimes we have new entire worlds to develop, and there's so much that we have to think about. But as I said before, Superman has a 75-year history. <laughs> And we had to take that into consideration. And the classic line that people used when we were on Man of Steel was, respect the canon, but do a reboot. So that means, you know, use the names of the characters, but this is a new story of Superman. So what I did was, um, that was really important for me in terms of the language, because there are these character names and, and planet names that have been used for many years, and people have a very set way of saying them. So I can't go in and say Zod is now Zod. That's not going to work because we have to respect the canon. So I wrote out the names of all of the characters um, that were given to me in the International Phonetic Alphabet, which is this um, alphabet here. You can see the symbols, uh, which linguists use to document any language in the world. You can write down any sound in any language with this alphabet. So the top one is Laura Larvan, and then we have Jorel. Kalex, Kelor, and all these other things. Um, so once I had this figured out, then I could develop a sound system like my students do, and then put new words together. So that was really, sometimes um, we have to think about what the world, what is already there in the world, and how do we adapt to that for our world building mechanisms. Um, this is just the writing again, so the word Krypton. Uh, Ks are by themselves, and then consonant vowel pairs, and then a consonant, consonant vowel pairs for Krypton, yeah. Yes. Right. So, uh, no, you would still. So, glyphs are those ones that are entire word meanings, like hope. Right. Yeah. So, what you would do is if they're like Krypton, it, that was the tricky part. Um, and, but other languages I know do this as well. And so, you, the, if it's a vowel that's, or sorry, a consonant that starts, it's got its own symbol. And so, this big hook is the consonant by itself. Um, so you can always tell if it's a consonant without a consonant vowel pair because of that large hook. And then the next consonant vowel would go together. And then because there's a P and then a T, that can't work. So you have the P by itself. And that's kind of the process of how it goes. Yeah. This is also similar. People thought I had based it on Japanese um, katakana and hiragana as well. And because this, the sentence structure is subject, object, verb, which is also what Japanese use. I don't know if anybody speaks Japanese in the room. So similar to katakana and hiragana. Uh, so people thought I'd had this Japanese influence. And I do know a little bit of Japanese, skoshi, because uh, I lived in Japan for a year, but I've forgotten most of what I've learned because that was 10 years ago. Wasn't that, but people were interested. Um, so another thing was, this was part of the viral marketing that was done as well. Uh, the subject order was different, as I said. So it was um, subject object verb. So if we said I saw him, in Kryptonia it would be, I him saw. Uh, this comes from the uh, General Zod's video to Earth. Zod is looking for Kalel, and so he sends this message around saying, um, You are not alone. But in the viral marketing, uh, in the Kryptonian, it's You alone are not, which kind of sounds a little bit like Yoda, but anyway, it wasn't intended to be that way. Uh, and so these are the words written out. So this is the word for you in Kryptonian in the writing up at the top. So this comes from the Deep Space Radio, radio, radio Wave project that was developed um, in early 2013. The first one, it was kind of like, have you seen the movie Contact, where there's the big space telescope things that are in this, this loud noise? 
you were supposed to go on the Deep Space Radio Wave Project, there was transmissions coming, and then you could figure out these words. And so the first one was the number system, counting down, and when people figured out what the numbers were, they realized it was the um, June date of Man of Steel release. And the second one were these words, that was, you are not alone, which was a message to all of us. Um, so that was part of what I also helped with. So world building not just for the movie itself, but for this marketing for that movie coming up and really creative things that they're able to do for that. Another thing you have to consider in world building is that there may be some limitations. And this was one of mine, nonverbal communication. So here's Russell Crowe playing Jarrell, which is Superman's father. The council chambers, again, that we saw in the earlier picture, you can see the writing very clearly on the chairs here, and then also on these pillars. There were guilds on Krypton. There's the Artist Guild, and the Thinker Guild, and the Science Guild. Um, so they each have their own chair and a representative. So when I task my students to learn uh, or to develop their own language, one of the things we do is we talk about proxemics, or nonverbal communication. So prox being near, Emix being an insider's view, and it's things like people's personal bubbles when you're speaking. And different cultures have different sizes of personal bubbles. Uh, people look at each other in the eye when they're speaking to them. In some cultures, in other cultures, you don't do that. Um, different gestures. Thumbs up in Canada is one thing. In uh, Iran, it's a different thing. Uh, it's a very bad thing, similar to our middle finger gesture. Um, and so there are differences there. In world building, you can do those kinds of things. My students develop the coolest, I love, one of the, my favorite things of their projects are their nonverbal communication because um, they do things like uh, if they ride camels, it's a camel lengths apart, that's their personal bubble, or um, there's scarves and different, they have always these uh, accessories to help their nonverbal communication because we learn about that through a class. Um, but, when you're developing a world for a movie, you have actors like Russell Crowe. Who did, and you can't tell Russell Crowe, I'm sorry, Russell, your bubble is too large right now. You need to make it smaller, because that's the world I've developed. Um, or you need to not look people in the eye when you're speaking to them, because that's part of the nonverbal communication. So there's this limitation. I was not able to tell Russell Crowe how to act. That would have been crazy. Um, and it wouldn't have gone over very well. So that was one of the limitations. So you might come up against those limitations based on some aspect of the design, and that was very much one of mine. Another thing was the sounds. I could have added more sounds to Kryptonian and things that were more complicated, but I didn't because I knew there was a chance the actors might speak them, and I didn't want to give them something that would um, be very tricky for them uh, beyond that. And other people have mentioned that in language creation too. This was some of the slang, another thing. Sometimes you build your world and then um, interest develops in it. So uh, media uh, interest developed in Man of Steel after the fact when the language came out. I did many interviews. These are some of the, the slang phrases. The only reason I developed these, these were not in the movie. It was to do interviews because people kept asking me in interviews, OK, well, how do you say hello in Kryptonian? And I never developed hello, so I had to develop the world more after the fact. So this after the fact building um, can sometimes occur as well. So to say hello, uh, is that one on here? Hello is not on here. Uh, hello is sitan, which is not in here. Goodbye is on here, tinsikwa. Um, so different things like that. Some of the other viral marketing was the glyph creator, and I was involved in this. Um, this is to the get your Kryptonian name, and um, was, uh, I was given a list of names and then they were translated into Kryptonian. Uh, can I have a vo volunteer who would like to have a Kryptonian name today? Yes, okay, first person who put up their hand. So we're gonna do a little quiz together and everybody's gonna see it. Is that okay with you? Yeah. It's short, okay. Children of Krypton are born into these specific houses. So you're gonna get your shield for your house. You have an extraordinary sense of morality, perception, or adventure. Morality, okay. When you encounter cruelty or injustice, how do you respond? I react immediately and impulsively. I consider the consequences before taking action. Consider. When do you, or where do you go when contemplating your role in the fate of humanity? A wild, chaotic place, quiet, peaceful nature, at home with your family. 
Okay. And your name is? A-H-M-E-D. A-H-M-E-D. Okay. Uh, there we go. You are a member of the House of Dar. So here we go. This would be your what would you would wear on your costume. And that's what it looks like there. And then we have A by itself. And then H uh, by itself, because then it goes H M. There's the M, E, and then D. Um, so you can go and do this yourself. You can also learn more about your house. You can get the shield. So your ancestors stood for trees and roots and ancestors and family. Um, and then this is how you would, which is pretty close, Ahmed Dar. So it's adding the extra things. I will admit that Ahmed, how do you, is that how you pronounce it? Was not one of the 6,000 names I put in to be translated differently. Uh, that was not one of them. So uh, people like Trevor or John might have a, a, a different, this is like individual, right? We don't have that syllabicness there. Um, so I also had to develop part of the world building that came later was all of these glyphs and what each glyph would stand for. So the Superman glyph stands for hope um, and other things. No one will get the House of El, just so you know. Don't go trying. You won't get it. Um, but you can get other houses. I developed one for my father, who's a salesman. And it's the House of Ran, because his name is Randy. And it's for persuasion and salesmanship and stuff like that. So if you get Ran, that's my dad's house. All right, moving on from there. So you can go check that out. It's glyphcreator.manofsteel.com. Another thing I was involved with was developing um, words for the soundtrack. So this is Hans Zimmer's uh, developed a soundtrack, and this is the cover. And so uh, I had to develop words like drums and symphony and instrumental and things like that, which were not a part of being on Krypton either. As well, the S has changed here. Does anyone see anything different about this S besides the fact it's black and white? Anybody notice anything different? Yes, it is internal lines. That's right. So there is now writing, the syllabic system, inside of the S. And that's actually in the new costume as well. So the new Man of Steel movie, you will see that writing and other writing on Superman's costume, Man of Steel's costume. I can't tell you what it says, though. So go watch the movie. <laughs> so why was anthropology necessary, and how does this tie to world building? Um, so there's this relationship between language and culture that anthropologists know about, and um, we can help develop different things and, and um, show that relationship more strongly. Cultures evolve, and anthropologists know very much about that. And in this case, language evolved really quickly, faster than a speeding bullet is my little joke for you there. Um, and so we saw how things were evolving over time, even between the movie and then the viral marketing. Um, we also have knowledge of other cultures, anthropologists, and languages. As an anthropologist, I've worked with different indigenous communities. I've worked in Papua New Guinea. I've lived in Japan. Um, I, and I've also read about many different cultures. And I know friends who've worked in northern Ghana, or my students have. And so I can tell you, well, in northeastern Ghana, there are soothsayers, and this is what they do. And, and so I bring a lot of knowledge about cultures. And so if you are designing worlds, looking into anthropology, it's a really great idea. So what kinds of things do people consider so that your worlds will be more full and complete? Another thing that anthropologists are doing is looking at fan cultures now. And I've done this with the Navi speech community, who they are and how they developed. I know other anthropologists who are looking at World of Warcraft and the economic systems on World of Warcraft or how people communicate on World of Warcraft or um, whatever else other fan cultures there are. Uh, there's a really great anthropologist named um, Biela Coleman who is looking at anonymous and hacktivists. And she um, was allowed to go and study them and has a book out called Coding Freedom, all about anonymous. So different ways that people are moving online so we can bring that new knowledge. I think I'm running, I, I went over time on Man of Steel. I'm good? <laughs> Keep going, okay, well I'm gonna talk about a little bit about this workshop, the science of fiction, um, before I finish and then I'll have more time for questions. So in uh, the first science of fiction, which is from the 5D Institute of Immersive Design at University of Southern California's School of Cinematic Arts, where Alice McDowell is now teaching, the first one was in April of 2013, and we re-envisioned Los Angeles. We did Los Angeles 2.0, um, and that was the first time that this was done in a day. So we built a world in a day. We built new Los Angeles, 
And um, I was one of the key people who were invited. And some of us were set into specific groups. So there was the culture of fiction, the biology of fiction, the art of fiction, the fashion of fiction. And everybody went off into these rooms on that day. We were given set instructions of what Los Angeles 2.0 looked like. Um, and then we were uh, people who came to participate, were chose which rooms they wanted to be in. Culture of fiction had a huge amount of people. I think there were 60 or 70 of us on that one day. And it was chaotic. Um, and we eventually broke into smaller groups. And I was actually doing the education of fiction um, and in the culture of fiction for LA 2.0. And our education system was on a train in 20 years from now. Um, and there were reasons for that. And it was very interesting. Fast forward then to October of this past year. We did, they did the second one. And it was building Relau. And you can follow the hashtag Relau on lots of different social media. Um, and this was what Real looked, Relau looked like. It was a mix of Rio de Janeiro and Los Angeles. And it was a little island system um, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean that had fused these two cultures together. And um, they started this day by looking at this. Um, they, we got a little handbook. This is the back cover of it from the Culture Institute. This looks like writing, but there was never any sign of a language, specifically from Rilau. And they, the first thing they did was we had our anthropological cabaret. And so these anthropologists, pretend anthropologists, had gone to Rilau 20 years in the future and had come back in time to report to us about what Rilau was like. Um, and it was very fascinating. Different people talked about different things. And then we were all sent off into the world to develop more of Rilau again in one day. Because Alex McDowell's students had been working on Rilau for two semesters already, there was a lot of information, which was so much better than the first science of fiction event, because it was more organized. And we all played. We all broke into our groups. I was in the Sky Ring group. There were different um, areas of the world. And we had this role-playing game. And, these, and they had developed these really cool card game sets, which I hope they sell one day. <laughs> Um, and so there were different things about themes, the time period. These were our visioning cards. And so in our groups, we were broken up into smaller groups. And we had to envision Rilau. And um, we would write these visioning statements and then choose the best one. And we did that before lunch. It was all very interesting. You can read more about it in Susan Carlin's article on Fast Co-Create. These were all the distri different districts of Rilau. So my district, as I said, was the, where did I go? We were the sky ring. Where are we? Thank you. <laughs> Up there. Um, and so there were all very detailed descriptions of each of these and the politics and the economies and the people in all of these different um, class systems. So after lunch, we were given other people's visioning statements from before lunch. And we had to develop the products of those to actually make concrete things to build this world. And so. Uh, one of the things that we got in my group was um, this card about how there was a religion that had formed in our district called the Disciples of Lao, and they were doing mass genocide and hiding the bodies um, in the catacombs of this world that we were in. And so this was a note that we heard about um, where this information was being, stop using this poison, it's leaving behind too many remains from the bodies, we need to move on to this. Um, and so I developed a code. Uh, from this based on the different regions. Um, and so I translated it into a phonetic alphabet. And so then if it said, this was the Mooka tree forest, so it was MTF, and then whatever the sound it associated with. So then if you look in my note, if you see MTF 88, then it would be the sound f, because that was the eighth sound in there. So this very complex code that I developed in about an hour, and I got really into it, and I was frantically trying to write all of this down. Uh, it was pretty fun. That was one of my products. So all of the products from Rilau can be reviewed at the remote viewing platform, which we then, after we finished, we went back to the main auditorium, and we all got to see what other districts had developed, some of the key um, pieces of the world that we had built. And it went from the timelines in the game went from 1980 to 2055. And there were pieces of the history of Rilau from all the different districts um, included on this remote viewing platform. So you can learn more about the science of fiction event here and what we were doing. And then you can see all the different projects. Um, these are some of them. And everybody was encouraged to bring the tools of their trade. So the people that I mostly worked with were artists, graphic designers, 
Um, so some of them have computers. We had filmmakers. This is one of the videos. And they're all tagged in different ways um, here. So Clubhouse was one of the themes, Flag, Liberty, the year that it was developed, stuff like that. Aquatic mining chant, you can watch this. You can see all the different people involved. Um, tattoos were very popular throughout Rilau. So this is one of the tattoos. You can also search, oh, where did it go here? Um, via all of these different locales. These were part of our uh, RPG games. The object, the theme, the year, and then the district. So my district, as I said, was the Sky Ring. So these were some of the ones that we developed. This is about the Sky Ring and who we were, the STEM technology. We lived up high. This is one of the ones my group developed. It was a Teleforge from 2055. Uh, and then you can see the objects, so we made things. It's a 10-foot long fork extender used by Rilauan military cadets to spear banned fruit from beyond the fence of their military base. So this is what somebody else had developed for us. Um, and here's me listed as one of these people in the little diagram. And then we had to develop it. Um, Real Reality TV from 2002. So you can watch the video of that. Uh, here's my internal memo. So what it looked like, all the different pictures that we uploaded. So everybody was frantically uploading these. Um, so while in the catacombs, Charles found an anonymous, in, an anonymous encoded letter. Uh, fervent disciples were responsible for killing, hiding bodies. So this was all of the things that people use. So you can look at all the different pictures. Dear sir, in the sometimes messy work of mass execution, bacterial action on the So this is the letter in English that I translated with my code and all of those different things. So you can see all of that here uh, in there. So that was the world building. So all of these projects then are going to be published in a book produced by the New Yorker um, as well. And they are still, Alex's students are still doing different projects related to this. And so this world has really grown in, and, and we helped it grow in this science of fiction um, workshop over a, a day. Um, and then all of these things are contributing to that. So the students are taking them and developing them even further. So I will just finish then with a thank you to all of these lovely people, including you. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. Absolutely. Right. So the writing, um, one of the things I mentioned to the world, there was no straight lines. So there are no straight lines in the writing system either. Um, another one was, for example, that this, I mentioned that the word order was subject, object, verb. And there was a very cultural reason why we chose to do that. The Kryptonians were being very selfish and they were using all the resources of the land. So that's why we put subject first because it was all about I, right, and who that was. The next one was the object because they also had this really strong attachment to their objects. They were um, writing on them. All of the history of Krypton was on there, so object came section second, and then the verb. So that was one thing. Um, another one, uh, just how the words connect to each other. Um, one of the sounds, like because Zod was Z, and there was that very strong sound, anything that was negative, I tended to give a Z sound to. So the word for war is the lore, because it's Zod. And so all these very, it, they're actually voiced sounds. So when your vocal cords vibrate, Z, G, things like that, those tended to be the negative things. So because we see that in real languages too. And um, we can see what's important because if fish is a really important staple for a community, there are numerous words for fish in that language. And so, yeah, definitely that plays a role. And if you don't do that, you're not doing a good job of world building. You need to have that connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how far do anthropology findings of our world apply to cultures from a different planet? Mm -hmm. I, very good point. It depends too with that society, uh, what the society is like. Is it a humanoid society, first of all? If you have an animal, more like animal society, that's going to impact different things as well. Um, but I think if you look at the, the wide range of societies, there are pieces you can pull from different cultures and societies in the real world and apply them to um, alien world in some way. So you don't need to model things exactly. You can take something and turn it around, right, and develop something new with it. Um, I know that I've had students do animal languages, and there was a great post recently about making animal languages, because if, oh, um, one of my students did fox language, 
And foxes' sounds they make are very different than human sounds. So how do we take things like that, for example? And that's a very language-based idea, um, but you can use similar things and twist them and, and change them to make them fit. So I think it would be really relevant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have a paper that I've written um, called What Can uh, Endangered Language Communities Learn from Created Language Communities? Um, and in there I talk about things like the cool factor. Um, and so a lot of indigenous language communities, they are losing 90% of the world's languages are endangered. Um, there are as very limited languages that are expected to survive longer. And so um, one of the things is really new speakers are required. And so sometimes um, if the tools that are being used for the indigenous languages aren't on the same level as the tools for things like, I mean, Nav Navi and Kryptonian had huge budgets behind them, right? And so we can get these cool products. So if you can find some way to make something cool, for that indigenous language, um, and I use them as a model, then that could maybe raise the status or the prestige of that language, and kids will go, yeah, I really want to learn that. And um, Navajo, for example, has been doing the Star Wars movies into Navajo. Or there are Berenstein Bears in Anishinaabe, or taking things from pop culture and translating them, um, which is not to say that all of it should be like that. I've also, in my work on indi uh, indigenous languages, developed board games, so kind of like, um, a monopoly where you travel through and you learn all the places, uh, you're not collecting anything, but you're learning that language by playing this board game. Um, things like that. So how do you use the same kind of technologies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is, what is the situation with language in your research or research from that perspective? Yeah. Well, the glyphs idea, part of the Kryptonian example, like from the, the costumes, was based on um, kind of like a Chinese, so that the symbols for the houses, like we saw in the, the here, um, would be also uh, the older form of Kryptonian. So in our world building idea, there was an earlier form. Kryptonians wrote very similarly to Chinese system, um, and then they developed this more syllabic writing system. Um, there are very few fan languages that do that sort of writing, but I know that other language creators, conlangers, use that, um, but it, they don't tend to be used in the fan system for some reason. I, maybe because they're harder. Most of the fans come from North America and no, or, or Europe maybe, and they're not as many Chinese ones, and so they tend to go with the more Roman alphabet. That could be part of the reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of part of the evolution of language. Yes. Like everybody comes forward from indigenous languages. Is do you ever consider looking at like how some of the languages you develop they transform? Whether it's you know Navi being next to Klingon, right? Somehow there's a transformation of language or dialect. Or yeah. Um, I didn't develop dialects for Kryptonian, although we did see the evolution from this writing system of the logographic, as I was just mentioning, into the syllabic, um, because it didn't end up being spoken on screen. And I should have mentioned that um, there was interest in that. And I think they did film some scenes, but it was a, a post-starting production thing, and it didn't end up in the final cut. But I know that um, they were really interested in that, and I would be asked to translate lines, script lines, for mostly Russell Crowe um, being the person on Kryptonian or uh, on Krypton who would speak Kryptonian. And so then um, it'd be like, we need this line for Russell Crowe, blah, 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 very quickly. Uh, uh, can we give him your cell phone number so that if he has help with the pronunciation, you can help him? And I said, yeah, give Russell Crowe my cell phone number. Uh, he never called, sadly. So um, uh, yeah, so stuff like that, right? And so, but then Russell Crowe is Australian. So if Russell Crowe had spoken it and spoken it differently than my Canadian, 
you know, even if we gave him the set, you know, he might have changed it a little bit. So when actors start speaking, that's when you really see dialects develop. So Navi absolutely does. Um, now with the sequels, they're talking about different dialects. So we only saw one part of Pandora in Avatar, and I know from rumors that there might be more dialects of Navi developing. So they're really changing that world too. Um, even within the digital fan community of Navi, though, there are people from all over the world who are learning Navi. And so I know that there are people who use Navi as their main means of communication. One is an English speaker, one speaks Estonian. They speak in Navi because that's the language they share. But Estonian accent on Navi is different than American accent on Navi. So in the fan community, the accents are changing as well. So people have looked at that, but in the ones that I've done, we haven't really seen that because there haven't been the tools to learn Kryptonian online yet. So. Right. Speak locally, so not everyone understands what you're doing. That's true. That hasn't happened yet. Um, and Paul Fromer is, um, he's done lessons, so they'll have like avatar meetups where people will learn. He'll teach people to do the more correct, right? Because we have this standard English, which it doesn't exist really, but there's standard Canadian, there's standard American, there's BBC, British English, and people strive for these standards. But that's just, uh, we've chosen that, right? That's all a part of who our culture is and what, what was chosen first. and. Um, it's, standards are just an interesting thing in, in anthropology in general because it's really talking about social status and, yeah. Yeah. Using these methods of evolving and creating the new language, we're the same method that so many languages in our world today are mm. evolving towards. Like all these, all these languages, how did they think of this? Other professors don't. Right. Uh, some languages, Hebrew is a really interesting example. Uh, because Hebrew was um, a religious la language, and then when the state of Israel developed, um, they brought Hebrew into secular communication. So there was one guy who really said, this is how we're going to speak Hebrew, and then that developed over time. And, but in other languages, like English, it's a multitude of people contributing to English. And sometimes we have people who are famous who come up with a phrase, and then that phrase becomes a part. And then it's kind of like that one person contributing, but it's more... Um, collaborative involvement, where fan languages, created languages, are, tend to be one person making the language, and then it, and then fans can take it from there. So the evolution b is the same, but how they start is different. I guess is what I'm trying to say, if that makes sense. And do you see a long term, like ten years in advance, do you see, for example, Avatar and now this language evolve more and have more users? Right. Yeah, no, Navi has definitely developed, Klingon has as well. Um, uh, Klingon though, Klingon speakers tend to be very strict and, and the creator of Klingon, Marco Krand, says I'm the one who decides what's new. Where Paul Fromer has developed a community of speakers to help him develop the language more. So he's been really inclusive for Navi, where Marco Cran says no. And Marco Cran says, I have a Klingon in my basement, and he tells me the correct forms. He's got this, this I forget the Klingon's name, he has this idea, right? And so um, they evolve differently depending on the motivations of the creator. There's also Esperanto, which was a created language. Does anyone know Esperanto? Yeah, uh, sort of, um, which was developed for the purposes of um, world peace. And, and that creator, Zamenhof, said, no, you take it and run with it. And that has shifted a little bit over time. I saw two hands, so I don't know. I think you were first, and then you. Yes. Ah. One of them is that so much of a, a culture is embedded within that language. And so um, some people liken it to burning a library, right? A language holds the information of a library. What people know about the environment. Um, and so if we lose those languages, we lose pieces of the world's knowledge, um, which is one of the, the biggest reasons. Another one is that people really identify with language. Who, what language you speak is who you are, is a person's identity, especially in these minority cultures where people have been colonized and, and beaten the language out of them, literally beaten. And so to bring it back shows that they are bringing that identity back and, and reclaiming that and decolonizing. Um, Another one is just the diversity of languages. The 10 languages that are expected to survive are all very similar. And we will lose that knowledge of what we can do with language if those other languages disappear. And so that's three reasons for you. Um, I would say culture connection first, and then the other two are really important as well. Yes? I just wanted to know, is there a moment in your life that maybe you suddenly realized you wanted to do more building for a living? 
Um, well, I don't know if I still do it for a living because I do teach at UBC's campus. So I think teaching and research, and I guess this is part of my research. Um, I guess I've done, part of the endangered language work that I've been doing has been coming up with ways to recreate domains of use for those languages. So I guess it started there um, and then developed into this other world building for more things like Man of Steel and looking at Navi and digital worlds. So it, to me, it flows together. So not a specific point, but. Oh, I see, okay. On a personal, yes, I'm one of those weird people who knew what they wanted to do when they were 12. Um, I knew in grade six in my social studies class that I wanted to be an anthropologist. And um, we were learning about indigenous people in Canada at that point in time in my social studies class. And I thought, wow, look at all the amazing differences in these cultures. I want to learn more about that. And so that was when I, I wanted to learn about cultures. And then the language part came later. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so in the movie, uh, Krypton had colonies on different planets. And so that didn't really come up in what um, I developed, but there might have been dialects that if we continued the world building, as we said further, we might have had more dialects. Um, and so that wasn't really a part of what we looked at. Um, but I, I, I feel like Avatar is moving in that direction. As I said, there's going to be, we saw Pandora, but we saw this part of Pandora. And it seemed like all the aliens were the same, but maybe now we'll find there are other ones. And I feel like good world building should consider that because it's very rare that you would find a planet where everybody is the same be from what we've seen in the past, right? Earth is so different. So I feel like that needs to be considered and, and coming up with different ideas would be really important. Um, we did that for Rilau, right? There was the different districts uh, in that little island. And so each district had a very different history. And so they were starting to do that, which is good to see. I want to talk about other geography things, but I feel like Richard is going to tell me I'm out of time. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks.